but I'm very excited to be able to introduce Ralph Rawls, who's been doing reverse engineering for two decades, um, has, uh, was the, uh, the lead developer on Bindiv, and has been publicly breaking, was the first research, researcher to publicly break virtualization obfuscators. Um, current, current versions of uh, the Meta CI, oh, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, CISC VM, um, oh my gosh, and just everything else. He is probably the most recognized uh, reverse engineer out there. Please welcome Ralph Rawls. Thank you. Okay, so this talk is about um, applications of an academic technology called program synthesis to reverse engineering. Uh, I first read about this stuff back in 2012 maybe, thought it was kind of interesting, and uh, gelled in my mind over the next couple of years how to uh, apply it to do interesting things in reverse engineering. So I hope you find it interesting as well. Uh, so, as the name implies, uh, program synthesis is dedicated to creating computer programs automatically. Uh, so, right. Uh, essentially, we start with a specification of how the program is supposed to behave and then feed it into a program synthesizer and out comes a program. Uh, so, this uh, very high level declarative view uh, does not give you everything you need to know about uh, program synthesis. Uh, the rest of the talk will be dedicated to filling in the details uh, in uh, applying this technology to a couple of problems in reverse engineering. And I've come up with a few more in the meantime, but they didn't make the talk. Uh, so it's important to think about program synthesis uh, in the right ways and with realistic expectations. I guess uh, the first thing you might think of if you think I could just say what I want the program to do and then feed it into a program synthesizer and out pops a program is, hey, can I ask it for a flight control software or web browser or something like that? Uh, and then it's just gonna say, yeah, here you go, here's, a, here's your web browser. But that's not what happens. That's not how it works. Uh, we need to specify uh, with the utmost precision uh, what it is that the program is supposed to be doing and um, the types of programs that we can uh, synthesize tend to be very small on the order of uh, 10 statements you might be lucky, 15 you might be pushing it, 20, uh, who knows. Uh, some, uh, some more advanced techniques allow uh, you to scale this technology further. Uh, but anyway, you shouldn't get your hopes up too high. We're not talking about you know, full components, full programs here. We're talking about small pieces of functionality. And that there is some uh, research out there in program synthesis that uh, handles programs with branching constructs in them, such as if statements and for loops and so on. Uh, we're not going to talk about them uh, in, in this talk, uh, and they're a bit more difficult. Uh, so we're just going to talk about loop-free applications. Nevertheless, uh, there's still some interesting things we can do even given uh, what may seem like rather onerous constraints placed upon us. Uh, so the right way to think about program synthesis is that first we need to specify how the program is supposed to behave. Uh, and to be specific, uh, we specify uh, its behavior in terms of a specification. So for example, uh, for the uh, absolute value function, uh, it should behave such that if we put in a positive number, we get back the same number, and if we put in uh, a negative number, we should get back the negated version uh, of that number. Uh, so, um, but note that this is not source code. We're not specifying uh, uh, how the program operates. We're just specifying these are the uh, effects that we want our absolute value function to have. And then insofar as how the absolute function is implemented, uh, that's what the program synthesizer attempts to determine. So we start with this behavioral specification. And then we just write a really small piece of code here to uh, test a given function uh, upon every possible value of the inputs. So here we have a for loop uh, that starts with the smallest possible integer and iterates all the way up to the largest possible integer. And then it just calls the absolute value function and then just checks to make sure that uh, uh, 
it behave properly upon uh, that input. And it's applied to every input as the for loop iterates over uh, the entirety of the space. And uh, if any of the uh, inputs fail the output check, then the whole thing is bogus. It needs to work on all inputs, so turn negative one. And only if all inputs pass the test, then we return zero. So specification, exhaustive test harness, and then we can just randomly generate every possible program that might implement uh, the absolute value function, for example. Perhaps the first program that we generate is return negative x. Next one we generate is return bitwise not x. Next one is negative x plus 0, not x plus 0, negative x plus 1, not x plus 1, and so on, generating exhaustively every possible function that might implement uh, the absolute value function. And then given the test harness in the middle of the slide, we'll know that if this test harness ever returns zero, then the program that we generated does in fact uh, implement the absolute value function uh, according to the specification that we've defined. Uh, so of course, with what I just presented, uh, there's uh, uh, more critical statements we could make about it than positive statements, really. Uh, so of course this is going to be extremely slow if we're, uh, you know, we're exploring uh, every possible function and then calling it four billion times a piece to make sure it behaves properly. And uh, in fact, there's an infinite number of programs, and uh, so the, this thing will never terminate. And it might be the case that the programs that we generate have loops in them, which might be infinite. So a given instance might never terminate. So this is bad news all around. So this is the first idea they came up with for program synthesis back in the 1960s. And then uh, there wasn't a whole lot of research done on program synthesis for the next few decades. And you could probably guess why. It's because they had really bad ideas about how to do it. Uh, along the way, some people wrote some papers about, well, maybe if we could be smart about the types of programs that we generate, then uh, you know, we might have some better luck and things like this. But uh, in the last couple of decades, really the last 15 years, I'd say, uh, program synthesis has made a bit of a resurgence because of some new technology we have available to us. So uh, the modern program synthesis that we're going to be talking about in this uh, talk is going to be better than what we saw on the last slide and um, use more sophisticated ideas. So uh, in order to, um, in order to uh, apply this technology to uh, reverse engineering, there's going to be uh, four main components that we're going to, uh, we're going to apply. So first of all, uh, as with most things in reverse engineering, we're going to need a disassembler to take machine code bytes and convert them into some symbolic representation of x86 assembly language. And then an assembler performs the inverse process, takes symbolic x86 and converts it back into bytes. Should be straightforward. Uh, the IR translator is a very important piece of this puzzle. Um, so es essentially, x86 instructions are very complicated and uh, it may seem like the add EAX ECX instruction uh, is very simple. It should just take two things and add them together. But in fact, there's all sorts of stuff that happens on the processor uh, in the background while this instruction is executing. Uh, in particular, the microprocessor has uh, condition code status flags. Uh, these things get updated uh, throughout uh, the course of execution. Some instructions reference these things throughout the course of execution. So the IR translator is, uh, takes an instruction and then produces a representation of what the instruction actually does. So that allows us to think about how uh, sequences of instructions work in very precise terms. The ability uh, to uh, discuss their functionality uh, with 100% precision. And then, uh, the IR translation from the last slide, uh, you know, it looks rather C-like. Uh, so in fact, the intermediate representation is a programming language. And as such, uh, we can apply most of the standard tools from programming language theory. So for example, we can write an interpreter for our intermediate representation, meaning that if we put in input values, 
we should be able to uh, interpret the intermediate representation according to those input values. And then we should get output values uh, as a result. And uh, furthermore, given that we said that the IR should represent how the instruction actually executes on the processor, that the results we should get from the IR interpreter should be the same as if we had actually executed it on the processor. And then the final piece is magic, SMT solvers. Uh, right. It's, it's, uh, one could say many, many things about SMT solvers. I'll just call them magic, essentially. So uh, the SMT solver allows us to sort of pose queries regarding sequences of IR, and uh, it will, so for example, uh, given this sequence of IR representing the add EAX ECX instruction, we can pose a query such that, for example, after this sequence executes, then the value of the zero flag is going to be one. And then this is a query, and uh, the SMT solver is going to analyze the IR and the query and give us uh, input values that we could put in. I'm sorry, this clicker thing is driving me crazy. The SMT solver is going to give us input values that we could put in to the IR such that it causes our query to be satisfied. So this value of EAX and this value of ECX, both of them being zero, if we add zero plus zero, and then ZF is the result, is the result zero? So yes, uh, these two uh, input values will give, us, uh, will give us the result that we want, i.e. satisfaction of this query. Okay, so those are the ingredients that we'll be using throughout the presentation. And then here are the problems that we're going to be uh, looking at. So the first one is uh, CPU emulator synthesis, or we could equivalently call this uh, IR translator synthesis. So previously I was discussing how we need to know exactly how the instructions execute in order to apply this technology. Uh, so, and uh, similarly, if we were writing uh, an emulator, you know, QMU or Box or something like this, uh, we would need to know exactly how the instructions worked in order for us to write code that simulated them. Uh, and this is a very time-consuming and difficult process. It turns out the, that the Intel manuals are very bad uh, at, at assisting you. So uh, our first application is based on a paper from Microsoft Research, uh, and uh, it's dedicated to uh, automatically figuring out how instructions behave, coming up with pseudocode descriptions of them, so at which point you can implement them directly into a CPU emulator or an IR translator. Um, second application is um, a subject that's always on my mind, uh, deobfuscation. Uh, I deal with a lot of uh, heavily obfuscated malware and things like malware in my work. Uh, so um, there's, a, there's one common uh, scheme uh, used for obfuscating code. There are many ways to obfuscate code, but this is a pattern that comes up over and over again, which is that uh, you'll, f you'll find repeating patterns in the obfuscated code, whereas one instruction has been converted into multiple instructions. In this case, before obfuscation, there was actually only one instruction, and then the obfuscator applied an obfuscator rule and exploded the one instruction originally out into five instructions and then it's going to apply these things repeatedly, so you're going to end up with huge obfuscated code. So uh, we're going to discuss a system for automatically uh, determining what the obfuscator rules are and uh, generating deobfuscators automatically for this particular variety of obfuscation. And uh, this, is, uh, this idea came to me while I was reading a paper out of uh, Stanford, I believe. And then finally, uh, this is probably the coolest application of all, but uh, it's hard to describe it uh, in, uh, in, in an overview form. So this is uh, dealing with uh, metamorphic code, metamorphic computer viruses, metamorphic obfuscators and such, uh, sort of get a handle on uh, determining how these things execute and uh, uh, writing tools automatically to deal with metamorphically obfuscated uh, code, viruses, et cetera. And uh, 
I'm using a technique here from a different Microsoft research paper. All right, on to the applications. So, as I was saying, uh, if, we were, if we were to set about the task of writing a CPU emulator, such as QMU or Box, uh, we have a rather onerous task of uh, wading through a stack of uh, manuals that uh, several years ago was over 3,000 pages long, and these days I'm sure it's even bigger than that. Uh, but at least we have manuals, right? Uh, and they're accurate and tell us how the processor actually works. Yeah, if only. Uh, so for example, this is copied and pasted directly from the Intel manuals. This is a snippet of pseudocode for the AAA instruction. And then, uh, uh, and this instruction dates back to uh, 8088, so this is not a new instruction by any means. Uh, one of the oldest instructions in the instruction set. And it turns out that the uh, pseudocode given in the manual is wrong. And it has been wrong ever since 1979. <laughs> and by the way, that's the first instruction in the manual. So, <laughs> you know, abandon hope, ye who enter here. Uh, so, you know, when confronted with this task, you know, basically I said to hell with this. You know, is it possible to write a tool uh, that will uh, that will do this for me. And uh, the seeds of inspiration were found in a Microsoft research paper that was solving a similar problem. So basically, uh, we want to be able to just take x86 instructions and then shove them into a box and then have the box spit out pseudocode description of how the instruction operates. And it's not actually that simple. There's a few more inputs to that box, but. So. That's right, I have this slide in here, which is an overview of each of the four components of the system. And then I find myself trying to explain the whole application right when I read this. So that, uh, I think I'm just going to uh, move on uh, to the slides. <laughs> so might as well, because, yes, anyway. Okay, so uh, the idea is that we are, uh, the system operates uh, in part by uh, generating a lot of guesses as to how the instructions might execute. Uh, and it allows, this is parameterized, this is user input. We allow the user to influence this process and uh, tell the system which guesses it should generate uh, throughout the course. So for example, um, so, so this is powered by uh, expressions plus substitutions. So for example, if I put as input uh, the expression EAX plus zero, and then I say you're allowed to replace the plus with plus, minus, and, or, or XOR, and I say you're allowed to replace EAX with EAX or ECX, then there's five substitutions for the addition operator, and there's two substitutions for the EAX, so five times two is 10, so we see two, 10 expressions that we generate just by taking this expression that we started with and performing the substitutions uh, as specified. So for example, we have EAX plus zero, then EAX minus zero, as that was the first substitution for plus, EAX and zero, and the second line is where we've replaced EAX with ECX and performed the substitutions. So uh, for any given instruction, we're gonna take it and we're gonna run it on the CPU a bunch of times, and then we're gonna figure out what locations is this thing actually modifying? Like, does it modify a register? Does it modify memory? Does it modify the uh, condition codes, the status flags? Uh, so the result locations are anything that's modified by the instruction. So for example, add EAX, e EBX modifies EAX, obviously, and then six uh, flags. So then we generate hypotheses uh, based upon the expressions that we generated on the last slide, and we just set them equal to something that was modified uh, by the instruction. So here's a bunch of different hypotheses for how uh, this add EAX, EBX instruction might behave, and most of these hypotheses are wrong. And that's okay. 
Uh, the next component of the system is the behavior sampler. Uh, so uh, we want to actually take samples of how the instruction works when we execute it on the CPU. Uh, so in particular, we want to be able to take an instruction and then say, I want to set EAX to 5 and ECX to 7 and then perform this instruction. And then I want to look at what state the processor's in after execution. Let's see. So basically, uh, we just take this instruction, and then, uh, as I mentioned, one of our ingredients is an assembler. So we just assemble this instruction, write it into executable memory, and then set the processor to the right state, execute the instruction. Uh, uh, after it's finished, take the state of the CPU, uh, save it, and then uh, now we have a sample of the instruction's behavior. We said, we put, the, it, we put the CPU into this input state, then we ran the instruction, now we have this output state. So we're gonna have these pairs. This is an idea that's gonna recur throughout this presentation. And we're gonna take something, and then we're going to execute it in some state, and then we're gonna see what the output state is, and then we're gonna save these input-output states. They will be very useful to us. Uh, now for the next component, we're combining the hypothesis generation with the behavior sampler. So um, let's say that this was the hypothesis that we generated through some combination of substitutions and then setting it equal to uh, result location. So here's our hypothesis, that the carry flag after the instruction executes is equal to whether EAX is equal to ECX. And then here is the data that we had from actually executing the processor uh, in a particular state. So we set in EAX and ECX to zero, and then after, and then we executed in the instruction, and then after we executed the instruction, CF was equal to zero. So now we can just take the IR evaluator and sort of plug these two, plug these things into one another. So we have a value for EAX, a value for ECX, and a value for CF. So we just plug all these numbers in, and then we get, you know, zero, i.e. CF out, equals zero, i.e. VEAX, equals zero, i.e. ECX. So from plugging those numbers in, we get this, and then we just simplify and we have zero is equal to one. That's false, zero is not equal to one. Therefore, uh, this hypothesis for how the instruction behaves is false. We know that because we have uh, an example showing us that it's false. This was our hypothesis, and then we collected data from the processor that shows that our hypothesis must be false because the carry flag evaluates to something different in the hypothesis than it did when we ran it on the processor. So uh, this component, the empirical sieve, just takes uh, the hypothesis generation from the beginning of this example and then generates a bunch of input-output samples by actually executing the instruction on the processor, and then it just combines these things together. It takes the hypotheses and say, is the hypothesis consistent with the data? If it's not, throw it away. If it is, keep it and test it against all the other data samples. So at the, at the end of this process, we're just going to end up with every hypothesis that was not able to be shown false as a result of executing the instruction on the processor and looking at the input-output states. And it might be the case that we have multiple remaining hypotheses after this. It depends upon uh, whether or not we had input-output pairs for every possible input for the instruction. So if we have more than one uh, hypothesis remaining at the end, then there's an additional step that we use. Okay, so this is where the SMT solver magic comes into play. Uh, there's a form of program analysis known as equivalence checking, which says, if I have two pieces of code uh, and they, they use the same input variables, if I put the same values in, do I always get the same output? Uh, and equivalence checking allows you to prove that two pieces of code behave identically, or if they don't behave identically, then it will give you an, an input that causes them to behave differently. So let's say, for example, that these are two hypotheses that remain after the end of the last step. That say this is what the zero flag was supposed to be. These were two hypotheses that were not able to be shown false through uh, random input-output sampling. 
So we want to know, are these two hypotheses always the same? Are they equivalent to one another? So if they are equivalent to one another, then we can just throw one of them away because since they're always identical, then we're really, the hypotheses, the hypotheses are identical, so we only have to consider one of them. But if they're different, that's where the interesting case happens. So if the hypotheses are different, then the SMT solver is going to tell us why they are different. In particular, it's going to give us input values that we can plug into our hypotheses that are going to cause them to behave differently. So we run this query against the SMT solver, uh, trying to find a difference between our two hypotheses. And it says, yes, these things uh, can behave differently. For example, if you plug in this input value for EAX and this input value for ECX, then the two behave differently. So now I can just take these uh, input values and then run them, run the instruction again on the actual processor and it's going to tell me what's, uh, which one of them is right. Uh, so uh, these are two hypotheses for uh, ZF. So this one's going to evaluate to zero in this case. And this, going, this one's going to evaluate to one in this case, so why don't we just take the instruction, execute it on the processor in this state, and then figure, and then see, was ZF one or was it zero? And if it was one, then we get to throw this one away, and if it was zero, then we get to throw this one away. So it was zero, we throw away our second hypothesis. So just to recap what we just said, this, this whole example in one slide pictorial form, so the first component was the hypothesis generator. We allowed the user to enter in essentially templates and then things that we can substitute into the templates and then out comes a bunch of hypotheses for how the instruction might, ex how, how it might behave. Then we had a component that took the in instruction in question and then executed it on the processor and generated uh, the input output data for it. And then we just combined the input-output data with the hypotheses, and we threw away all of the ones that were able to be shown to be false, such as the first one here. And then we ended up with uh, multiple hypotheses at the end of this, which were not able to be shown to be false. So then we applied the uh, equivalence checker, which allowed us to narrow down our hypotheses uh, to one single uh, example, uh, to one single result. So this is the behavior of the carry flag for that particular instruction or at least it's what comes out of the system. Now, if you put in, uh, it, there, there's some, uh, there's some uh, difficulties here in the sense that uh, in order to have 100% confidence in your results, you need to test the, uh, the hypotheses on every possible input state, and uh, that's not feasible for large instructions, such as 32-bit instructions, uh, so, uh, Ways around that include uh, sampling smaller instructions, such as 8-bit instructions, or, uh, and that way you can uh, exhaustively validate them. Or you can just sample randomly and then uh, try, to throw away, uh, uh, try to throw away as many hypotheses as you can. Anyway, so that's the first application. This one, hope it's a little more lively. So as I was mentioning in the introduction, um, there are certain classes of obfuscators that the way they work is they take a single instruction and then they replace them with a group of instructions that should have the same behavior. So for example, if I have an assembly language instruction that adds two 8-bit registers together, uh, it's actually, it's okay for me to put an addition uh, before the instruction and then a subtraction after the instruction. So for example, if I add five uh, to, to one of the variables beforehand and then I subtract five from the result afterwards, then I'm going to end up with the same thing because the addition and the subtraction of five are going to cancel out. Or for example, uh, here, here we have an arithmetic operation that subtracts one register for the other. And for example, if I take some other register and put it on the stack, 
and then I copy the thing on the right into that other register, and then I perform the subtraction, and then I pop the thing off the stack. That's going to have the same behavior, too. Uh, <clears throat> all it did was temporarily save a copy of a register onto the stack and then pop it off, but it per still performed the same s uh, subtraction of the same values, so uh, it's an equivalent substitution. So to see this type of obfuscation in action, let's start with Let's say we have one instruction uh, in the leftmost column here. And then uh, the obfuscator is going to look at this and it's going to say, do I have any rules that I can use to uh, expand uh, this instruction? And yes, for example, it can say, yes, I'll add a subtraction beforehand and then an addition afterwards of the same value. And so, okay, these three instructions are then going to be equivalent to the one instruction on the leftmost column. And then the obfuscator works by just applying this same idea repeatedly. So now instead of one instruction, now we have three instructions and we can ask the question for each one of them, uh, can we, uh, uh, is there anything we can replace this instruction with uh, that behaves equivalently? So in the second step, you know, we might end up with, okay, yes, uh, we took the add instruction again and expanded it out by putting a subtraction beforehand and an addition afterwards. And then for this add uh, AL9F, we then just replace it with this mess of seven instructions or so. And now we have an even bigger corpus of instructions that we can apply the same idea to again, uh, either replace them with equivalent uh, instructions or not. So for example, we might end up with, uh, you know, replacing this instruction with four instructions and then this instruction with three instructions and then this one with the four instructions. And then the very end, we end up uh, with uh, this, this, what we see on the rightmost column. So uh, we started with one instruction, and then we ended up with, you know, 15 or so, however many instructions there are on the rightmost column. And the thing is that they should have, you know, the same or similar behavior as the one instruction that we started to, with. So we can apply this process indefinitely. We can take one instruction and turn it into a gigabyte of equivalent instructions if we wanted to. Um, this is a popular uh, obfuscation technique uh, you see in commercial protections and uh, malware. So uh, insight is that uh, if we wanted to deobfuscate code like this, uh, we could sort of just apply the same idea in reverse. So we could sort of apply a pattern matching and say, well, okay, these first four instructions match some pattern that I know about, and I can just take these four instructions and collapse them down into one, and take these three instructions and collapse them down into one. And then so now I'm undoing the obfuscation layer by layer. So then uh, once, I have, once I have what's in the third column, then I could just apply the process again and then collapse down some more of the instructions, so replace these three with one, and then replace these seven with one. And then I have three instructions remaining, and I can apply the same process and collapse them down. And then I end up with the one instruction that I started with. And uh, so the deobfuscation just works exactly the same way as the obfuscation. Uh, it's, uh, whereas the obfuscation takes one instruction and converts it into multiple instructions. The deobfuscation takes multiple instructions and converts them into one instruction, but the rules are the identical, just applied in reverse. Uh, so, right, if we wanted to do something like that, then we would need to know what the obfuscator rules are that were employed uh, by the obfuscator. Uh, so, if you wanted to, what you could do is sit there and stare at obfuscated code and then look for these patterns and then write uh, pattern deobfuscators for them. Uh, but, uh, so I actually did this and I can't recommend it really. <laughs> uh, it took about uh, three, or three weeks the first time I did this for this, the one in question and uh, you know, I kept making these mistakes and then my mistakes would sort of compound upon one another where, you know, I'd try to make a substitution but then it would actually break the disassembly listing somehow and then some other rule would get applied and then I'd end up staring at something and it's obviously wrong but then have to sort of like figure out what went wrong and that's not a lot of fun really. So um, I was reading a paper about uh, solving a problem in compiler theory uh, automatically and a uh, sort of light bulb went over my head that you can take the same idea and apply it to deobfuscation. So I'll illustrate that. 
hopefully it's comprehensible. Okay. Uh, oh, right. So the main idea in, the, in what I'm about to discuss is that these things should have the same or similar behavior, i.e. the unobfuscated sequences and the obfuscated sequences uh, should behave the same way. So if you followed the last example, then maybe you should think like, well, okay, what does it actually mean for these things to behave the same way? That means if we put them in some input state and then execute them, that the output state should be the same. So that's the key idea in how do we figure out if, a, if an uh, if an obfuscated sequence is, is uh, the same as a deobfuscated sequence. So I'm going to start by uh, just collecting sequences of obfuscated code. And then uh, I'm going to uh, collect uh, input-output pairs for them. So I'm going to uh, convert this into intermediate representation, then put it in some input state randomly generated, and then collect the output state, see what the registers and memory are after execution. And so now I'm going to generate guesses for what I might be able to replace uh, these sequences with. So it's going to end up being rather similar to the previous example, where the first thing I do is I collect all of the parts out of, uh, out of the obfuscated sequence. So for example, it uses the EAX register, it uses the ESP register, and it uses the number four. So then I allow the user to input templates, uh, and then uh, the templates make reference to uh, arbitrary registers or arbitrary uh, constant values. So for example, my template might be push some 32-bit register. Then I just rummage through my operand parts, and as it happens, I have two 32-bit registers, EAX and ESP. So those are my first two candidates. And then for the second one, push immediate 32-bit. Well, I have a 32-bit immediate that I collected from the sequence. It's the number four. So that's my third candidate, push four. And then as for uh, the, third, uh, the third template, obviously I can substitute in either one of those registers and the immediate four. So here are my final two candidates. And now I just uh, exploit the fact that if, if a replacement is to be valid, that means that they must have the same behavior. So I take the, re the candidate replacements, and then I just run them through the, uh, the intermediate representation interpreter using the same input state that I started with before. And then I take the output values. And then I just compare the output values of the obfuscated code operating in that state with uh, the potential deobfuscated code operating in that state and compare them. And if, they, uh, if they're the same, that means I've just learned a rule for deobfuscation. Uh, so, right. Uh, if the, uh, the input-output states match, then that gives me some evidence that these things are the same. But really, uh, I can pull out the SMT solver at this point and then actually formally prove mathematically that these things behave identically. So it's not just uh, some weak statistical evidence that I have for indicating uh, the similarity of these sequences. I can actually formally prove it mathematically with 100% certainty. So that's what the SMT solver is going to do for us. Just equivalence check them against one another, and if they're proven equivalent, then uh, we have our deobfuscator rule. So for example, these two instructions turn into this one instruction on the right-hand side. So uh, you might have remembered from the, de the demonstration of the, de the uh, obfuscator and deobfuscator rules at the beginning that they made reference to these abstract registers. We were allowed to refer them by name, such as reg8, one, reg8, two, and so on. Whereas this rule is using specific register names. This one is using the EAX register, which occurs in both the obfuscated and the obfuscated sequence. So then we have another phase called generalization that takes uh, specific registers and then tries to replace them with uh, any arbitrary uh, registers or immediates, for example. So we take this one rule that we learn that's specific to the EAX register and then try to learn a new rule that is uh, not specific to the EAX register and lets us put in any other register. So it just removes the specific register and immediate values. 
So I think now I have an example of the system in action. Right. So starting with uh, this piece of obfuscated code here, we're going to uh, we're going to go through it and look at groups of instruction at once. So on the uh, left hand side of the slide, we're going to have uh, a series of arrows following us around, and uh, that's what we're going to use. Uh, we're going to be looking at these groups of instructions as indicated by the arrows. So uh, we'll look at more than one instruction at a time, given that the obfuscator works by taking one instruction and replacing it with more than one instruction. So we start by looking at the first two instructions and then performing our uh, procedure. And then it turns out that, yes, uh, here's, we learn a deobfuscator rule as a, part of, uh, as, a, uh, as a result of this. So OK, we learn a rule. And then now we have simplified the code by replacing uh, the obfuscated sequence with the deobfuscated sequence according to the rule that we just learned. OK, so now we're dealing with these two instructions at once now. And we uh, run, run these things through our system. It doesn't find any deobfuscated sequence. So we keep going. And now we're looking at these three instructions and these two instructions, and we don't find anything. And now we're looking at these four instructions and these three instructions and these two instructions, and we don't find anything. And then uh, we move on to the next instruction, and we look at these two instructions, these three, these four, these five. And we look at the last two instructions, and then we find uh, our system tells us, yes, you can replace this sequence with this sequence. So OK, we learn a new rule and continue. So now we're looking at these two instructions, these three instructions, these four instructions, these five instructions. We don't find anything for any one of those sequences. Move on. And now, looking at these three instructions, we find that we can replace it with this deobfuscated sequence. Uh, on the next step, we find that, hey, we've already learned this simplification already, so we'll just perform the simplification, replace the code, and so on. And we just keep walking through the code and then learning rules and generalizing them and uh, learning the rules as we go, simplifying progressively. And we just continue walking through the code like that uh, until uh, we've, we've reached the end, at which point uh, it'll be uh, simplified down to its lowest possible terms, uh, assuming that uh, the uh, generalization component uh, has sufficient templates to cover uh, all of the possible obfuscation possibilities. So uh, now that we have deobfuscated rules, we just run them through a code generator, and then we produce Python code or C code or OCaml code or whatever. And now we have a program that automatically uh, implements this deobfuscation procedure for us. Uh, and then if you're paying attention, you might have noticed that the deobfuscated rules are actually the same as deobfuscated rules. It's just the columns are flipped. So uh, you could also run that through the code generator, and then it'll produce an obfuscator for you, which is kind of neat, I think, that you could just point it at someone's code and steal their obfuscator rules. So this works extremely well. Uh, I have implemented this. Uh, it's production quality, unit tested, blah, blah, blah. Uh, one. It does have some limitations in a theoretical capacity, though. Uh, so you might have noticed that uh, there were, we didn't take into account control flow. Everything we looked at was a state straight sequence of code with no branches or loops. Uh, so control flow does cause us a problem. So uh, in this example, uh, if you're familiar with compiler theory, uh, you recognize this as being uh, a liveness analysis or a dead code elimination. So in this block right here, you, with the blue arrow pointing next to it, uh, we just overwrite EDX with the number 0, which means that in any, uh, any path leading to here, it actually does not matter what the value of EDX was, because we just overwrite it with 0 without making reference to what the previous value was. Uh, so if we knew that the value of EDX doesn't matter, then we could just sort of throw this line away because we would know that EDX was not going to be used again, and that instruction writes to EDX. Uh, but since we don't, and, and if we did know that, we could just throw that instruction away, and then we could perform a simplification and so on. But since we don't uh, keep track of uh, register liveness, that uh, we, uh, our system isn't smart enough to know that, so it's not smart enough to learn that particular rule. Uh, it is possible to uh, uh, incorporate a liveness analysis, but uh, 
turns out that uh, control flow and obfuscation uh, forms this really nasty cyclic chicken and egg problem. Uh, it's a very it's a mess in theory. Uh, so under some reasonable assumptions, uh, you can implement that pretty easily, but uh, uh, then there are also cases where it will fail you. Okay, and this is the, uh, the last example. It's also my favorite. Uh, start off with a little brain teaser. So let's say, remember that program synthesis is of course about creating programs uh, that uh, conform to some specification that we've defined. So let's say I want to create the function x plus 1, and I allow myself to use uh, two statements, one of uh, using the not operator and or the neg operator. So for example, uh, this uses the, neg, the not operator twice. This one uses not followed by neg. This one uses neg followed by not. This one uses neg followed by neg. So I have these four different programs here, and I want to know does any one of these, in, uh, does any one of these uh, implement the function x plus 1? So I can take this and then I can phrase the program symbolic, uh, phrase the problem symbolically. So I can write this in terms of C code and I can say, well, on the first line, I'm allowed to either have a negation or a not operator. And on the second line, I'm allowed to have a negation or a not operator. So why don't I just pull that responsibility out and place it on these two Boolean values, BOP1 and BOP2. Uh, and so really when I'm asking this question about uh, can I make this program that does x plus 1 based upon neg and not, what I'm really asking is can I set the values of these two Boolean variables such that this function f will always uh, return x plus 1. And then it turns out uh, SMT solvers can solve this problem for us very directly. So uh, we could just sort of take the question in English and then convert it directly into mathematics. So we're looking for values of BOP1 and BOP2, uh, the two Booleans in the previous sequence. So if you know your math, that should be obvious that we can represent that by an existential quantifier. And then the next part of the question is, we want this function for all values of x, and uh, once again, if you know your math, you can represent that with a universal quantifier. And then the rest of it is just a straight up translation of the C code into something that the SMT solver understands. And you just take all of that and pass it to the SMT solver and it says, yeah, here's your values. BOP1 should be set to false and BOP2 should be set to true. In other words, your function should be neg of not x and that's going to implement x plus one for all possible values of x. Uh, so the interesting thing about this example is, of course, not the specific result uh, that, uh, that that function is equivalent to x plus 1, but the interesting part is that we have a framework where we can sort of ask questions about, uh, ask questions that sound like that. Uh, so uh, we, can, we can extend this idea a little bit. So. Um, for example, um, we were using two operator types, either neg or not, but, and that was controlled by a Boolean variable. So it should be pretty obvious that well, if you use something that has more than two values, then I can represent more than two different operators, right? So maybe I say, if op is equal to zero, then I do neg, or if op is equal to one, then I do not, and if op is something else, then I do x minus one. Uh, so that one's pretty obvious. If you use something more than bool, which only has two values, then obviously you can represent more than two operators. And uh, the one on the right-hand side is a bit more subtle, uh, that we can sort of incorporate constant numbers into these equations. Uh, so for example, so here we're using another Boolean for our operator value, and we say if, if, boole if the Boolean is true, then we'll return x plus this constant c1, and if the boolean is false, then we'll return x xord with c1. Uh, so now this c1 is sort of part of our system, and that's something that the solver must provide to us. Uh, it has to give us a value of c1 if it tells us that uh, the system is satisfiable. Okay. <coughs> 
Now we're going to apply this to a problem in metamorphic virus analysis. So there's a metamorphic obfuscator that generates code that looks like the following. Uh, it, so the purpose is, it in uh, there's data associated uh, with the virus, and uh, the authors want the data to be encoded differently in each different sample. Uh, so uh, what they do is, they have these little decoder functions where they encode the data pr in, in, a, in some way, and then they put a function into the binary that then is responsible for decoding that data. And then it turns out that on their end, they're using a template that describes what the, uh, what the, uh, me the decoder engines are allowed to look like. So it always is going to look like this, where op is either addition or subtraction or XOR. And I81 and I82 are 8-bit uh, constant values. So for example, uh, you know, here's the abstract description of it. But here's something you might actually see in, in such a metamorphic virus where here we replace the first op with an add, and here we, we replace the second op with an XOR, and the I81 is replaced with 82, and the third op is replaced by sub and that constant. And so after having uh, generated a decoder for uh, the virus, then it's going to apply uh, obfuscation to the encoder such that we can't just look at it and see directly uh, what the values are. Uh, it's you know, represented in some sort of uh, obfuscated form. So uh, it's difficult to us to figure out what the uh, encoder function or decoder function is actually doing. Uh, so the goal of this uh, exercise is given obfuscated code that looks like this, and given that we know that all of the decoder functions behave according to this skeleton, that we want to be able to re dis recreate what the decoder function was without deobfuscating it. We want to be able to uh, f uh, you know, recreate uh, the decoder function uh, um, using program synthesis just based upon how this thing behaves as opposed to what it looks like. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to take this decoder and then we're going to, we're going to generate a uh, symbolic representation of it. So this is similar to what we saw when I was talking about the, uh, at the x plus 1 example, where I had you know, a function that had Boolean variables that dictated whether things were neg or not. So that idea survives where we have these four variables, op1, op2, op3, and op4, and that corresponds to the fact that each one of these ops might be add, subtract, or XOR. So indeed, if op1, if, if the op is zero, then we do an addition. If op is one, then we do a subtraction, and if op is anything else, then we do an XOR. And then remember that we're allowed to put constant values into these formulas, so Indeed, uh, the second line of the decoder has this op al i1, so we saw already how to encode uh, different operations, and then we just encode the i81 by this constant value c1, and similarly for the next line, constant value c2 and encode it there. So this is our, our representation of every possible decoder function that the metamorphic engine might generate. So um, this always feels like pulling a rabbit out of a hat uh, and sort of leaves the audience blank. Uh, that uh, if you remembered how we solved the last one where uh, we just said there are values of the operator <coughs> variables such that for every input we might put in that uh, the x86 code, the obfuscated version, uh, behaves identically to this template. And so uh, the solver can actually solve this directly. Uh, you, we, can, uh, we, can, we can just put in the template and the x86 code and then say, uh, this x86 code always behaves according to this template. Tell me how. Give me, uh, give me values for the operators and uh, the constant values. And the solver will come back and say, yeah, OK, you should have add in the first line and xor in the second. Your constant should be d2 and so on. Uh, so yeah, I don't like to pull a rabbit out of a hat, plus the solvers uh, still don't work very, they're not as good with quantifiers. So we'll show another uh, 
another approach to this problem is hopefully uh, more transparent. Okay, so this idea comes back. It, we, had, we saw this in both of the previous examples where uh, we generate input-output pairs uh, for things. So in this case, the thing that we're generating the input-output pair is the uh, obfuscated version of that x86 code corresponding to the decoder. So we put it into some input state and then we run it through the interpreter and then out comes an output state. So for example, if we set AL to zero and BL to zero, and then we ran all this stuff through the interpreter. After the sequence executed, we'd have the value of BL is equal to E1. So this is an input-output pair showing how that obfuscated x86 behaves upon that one single uh, input. So now that we have an input-output pair, and remember we have our template that describes all the possible ways that this thing is allowed to behave, the metamorphic decoder template, why don't we just take the input-output state and plug it directly in uh, to the template? So we'll take uh, this template as referencing the variable AL. Every, every place we see AL, we'll just replace that with zero. This template references BL. Every place we see BL, we'll replace it with zero. And uh, the final value is the final value of BL, so we'll just say that the value of D is equal to that value. So we just took our input-output state and then plugged it directly into the template and now this is telling us that on that one input state uh, that uh, the, uh, the decoder must have uh, this, particular, uh, this particular output state. Okay, so we took, uh, we generated an input output state giving us an example of how the obfuscated x86 actually behaves and then we took that and we plugged it into uh, the template and then we could just sort of take that and feed it to the SMT solver, and if it's satisfiable, what we're going to get out is it's going to be a function that uh, behaves identically upon that one input state that we tested it on. Now, it's not guaranteed that it's going to match on any other input state, but it is guaranteed that if we put in that, that input state that we already tested that we're going to get out the same value. So, for example, it's going to give us values for op, op, op 1 through op 4 and C1 and C2. So maybe if we take those, maybe it'll be, tell us that, you know, the first three are XOR and the last one's plus and that these are the two constants. So here's, here's going to be our function that's going to behave properly on that one specific input value that we tested. Uh, so now we can just apply equivalence checking and then we say, is this function you've just given me identical to the x86 code? If I always put in the same input state, are they always going to give me the same output state? Uh, and uh, if they're not, then of course, by the magic of SMT solving and equivalence checking, that it's going to give us an, uh, an input state that we can put in to cause them to differ from one another. So it's going to give us, it's going to say, for example, no, the x86 code is not always identical to this template, and here's an example that if you put in AL is equal to zero and BL is equal to 88, then your template is going to behave differently from the x86 code. Uh, so now I just apply these ideas in a loop. So I started off with one witness, uh, which was where I plugged the input-output state into the template, and then I synthesized a function for it, and if it couldn't synthesize a function, that was a problem, something went wrong. If it did synthesize a function, then I just equivalence check it against the x86 code. And then if the equivalence checking says they're identical, then I'm done. And if it's not, then it's going to give us a new input-output state. So then I'm going to create a new witness. And now I have two witnesses. And I just apply this idea in a loop. So I have a pictorial overview of this process, just in case anybody got lost during that, that this, is, uh, this should uh, bring, hopefully bring you back. So to wit that this is the decoder uh, that we're trying to generate, uh, we're trying to generate an uh, identical decoder for it. And this is the deobfuscated version. Note that the protection also obfuscates this thing. So just for simplicity, so it'll fit on one slide, I have the deobfuscated version here. So I took an input-output pair of this, meaning I put this into some random input state, and then I looked at what the values that came out were, and then I plugged those into my template that describes the metamorphic decoders. And then I asked the SMT solver, please give me a function that uh, causes it to behave the same way on that one input-output pair. Uh, 
And then here's the function that comes back. So now I say, okay, is that identical to the x86? And if you look at it, it's clearly not. Uh, the x86 has add in the first line, this one has xor, has uh, sub in the third line, this one has xor in the third line, and the constants are all wrong. So when I equivalent, oh, but it does have the last one right, which is at the addition. So I, and I take this and I equivalence check it against the x86 and I say, does this match the x86? And of course it doesn't. So it's going to say, no, it doesn't match the x86. And if you set BL to this value and AL to this value, that these things are going to differ from one another. So OK, now I have a new input state that I can generate a new uh, witness from. So I take this, and this is now my input state. And I run it through here, and I get a new output state. So now I have two input-output pairs. So now uh, I'm going to generate a new program based upon these two input-output pairs. And then ask the SMT solver, give me a program for that. And you can see on the second iteration, it's already very close to uh, what the actual uh, function was. Here we have an add in the first line, as it should be. Uh, we have XOR on the second line. And notice that the constant was D2, whereas this one came back with a D9. So that's pretty close. And then we have sub on the third line. We already have that. And then the constant is pretty close. This one has E8. This one has F1. And then the final line has an addition. Uh, so it has that. So after just two input-output states, we already have something that's very close to uh, what the decoder function was. But yet we don't know that. This is a fully automated system. So we just continue and say, OK, now this function is this thing identical to, uh, the, uh, uh, to the x86. And once again, no, it's not. And here's an example uh, of input state that you can put in to cause a difference. Now I use that to generate a new uh, decoder program from three witnesses. And uh, it's already getting, it's, already, it's converging very rapidly down to the actual function. But once again, I don't know that, so I just ask, uh, is this identical to the x86 code? No, it's not. Here's an example that you can put in uh, that causes it to differ. And then on the final, final one, this is the one generated from four input-output pairs. Uh, they are actually identical. So we have addition, XOR. XOR has the same constant. Uh, so this one has a sub, whereas this one has an add, but that's OK, because this is the negative version of that same constant. And then the add is the same at the end. So these are finally identical. But once again, I still don't know that. So I just uh, ask, are these things identical? And it says, yes, they're identical. There's no input that you can put in that causes them to differ from one another. So now I know that this is identical to the uh, decoder in the obfuscated x86. Right, what is the conclusion of all this? Uh, yeah, so um, I read a lot of academic papers and uh, I take a lot of heat for it in the industry because uh, there's a strong anti-academic vibe. I could talk a long time about why I think this is and uh, not that I give uh, the academic people, uh, you know, the benefit of the doubt, or uh, you know, I'm side with them 100% in this debate. But uh, it dismays me that, nevertheless, maybe uh, the baby has been thrown out with the bathwater because I think uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can do with this type of technology. Uh, I hope uh, there's still people here, so maybe somebody even enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so as it happens, uh, you know, I uh, run a. Uh, company that teaches training classes on uh, a variety of things in computer security centered around reverse engineering. And uh, I have a class about uh, SMT-based technologies. Uh, so it, it's more than just program synthesis, but all this stuff is covered. So if you're interested in learning about stuff like this, uh, you know, uh, details of the course are on my website. Uh, I think it's a good class. So uh, right. Um, so if you want to check out my website, I have uh, my life's work on there. Um, check out the research section or my blog or whatever. And then I offer some uh, you know, commercial services. So uh, that's the end of the talk. Anyone have any questions? Okay, we'll go with you. Go to the mic. <laughs>
was a really good talk. So uh, I had a quick question about the super people the op people super deobfuscation slide or, sure. or uh, technique. Um, I noticed in your slides in a few places that um, you talked about instruction being like similar enough, but it seemed like the definitions in your IR were really strict. Can you talk a little more about that? Sure, that's an excellent point. Yeah, I sort of glossed that over. Uh, this slide sort of speaks to that. Uh, so, right, um, ultimately I said, you know, we want uh, the, uh, the behavior of the obfuscated code to be the same as the deobfuscated code, uh, but it turns out that uh, yes, when we say identical, we're really talking about something extremely strict. Uh, so, for example, uh, with this obfuscator rule where this is, um, we took a subtraction and then we replaced it with four instructions and then uh, it ended up pushing something off of the st onto the stack and then performing the subtraction and then popping the thing off the stack. So strictly speaking, these things are, do not have identical behavior to one another because this one pushes something onto the stack even if it later pops it off. And uh, on x86, we don't care about things below uh, the value of the stack pointer. So uh, the way you address that is just in your uh, state comparison function, uh, you get to define what it means for two states to be equivalent. So for example, something that's below the stack pointer, uh, I just instructed not to include that in the comparison. And then also I can make the, same, uh, make the same considerations when I'm doing equivalence checking. I can say, are these two things equivalent? And by the way, I don't care if things within 12 bytes of the final stack pointer are the same. Sure. Great talk, I really enjoyed it. Um, I was curious what your preferred SMT solver is in practice. Is like Z3 still state of the art? Yeah, I still use Z3, I like it. Uh, it's got, I, it supports floating point these days, for example, which is you know something big and uh, many of them still don't support it uh, and it's entirely open source. That said, um, I think it's Yisis or maybe CVC5. No, Yisis for sure. Uh, it supports, um, it supports, it's a very technical name for it, uh, bernays Schernfinkel fragment. So uh, in the, uh, the symbolic program synthesis example I had this, there exists values in the template such that for all inputs, I can talk about the output. So this exists for all is a very common pattern in program synthesis. And um, Yisis has a solver that specifically works on formulas that have this exists all structure. So I haven't played with it yet, but I'm excited to. Yep. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, great talk. <clears throat> I had a question uh, in the metamorphic extraction example towards the end where you were talking, uh, you walked through like first it guesses this and then this, and you were talking about it getting closer. Uh, but based on your discussion of how it works, um, you basically have a binary yes or no, does it match? And I was curious if your analysis has any intuition into are we getting closer or not? Because that seems like you could significantly reduce the search space, whether uh, you're getting closer versus just like a yes or no, because there are millions and millions of things to try. Yeah, uh, yes, you're correct. Uh, the way it works is straight up equivalence checking, which returns a binary true or false, and uh, so. Uh, right, there's no uh, no uh, checking to see whether we're getting closer or not, it's just are we there or not. Uh, so right, the idea that you mentioned essentially the core of it, which is you know talking about are we actually getting closer, uh, that's the core of something called stochastic super optimization, which essentially uh, uh, it looks, it takes the hamming distance between uh, the, the input output vectors and then f tries to uh, modify the thing in ways that actually causes the outputs to become closer to the desired values. Uh, my system doesn't do that. Uh, I think in this particular example, there's no need to do that. Uh, however, uh, uh, stochastic super optimization is one of the ways that they're scaling this technology uh, to get bigger and bigger. So stochastic super optimization might allow you to deal with uh, 50 instructions at a time instead of 10, for example. So yes, good question. Uh, read up on stochastic super optimization. <laughs>
does, oh, we do have a question. So everything I saw was sort of contiguous de op de op de obfuscation, uh, where the instructions were all clumped together. Um, have you seen any, any non-contiguous deobfuscation where maybe the, 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 the meta instruction is, is scattered over a much larger set of uh, instructions? Yeah, so at the very end, uh, there was this one example showing like where this would fail. So uh, this gave an example of like, it has, you know, we might call this junk code, which is that it's put an assignment to, uh, in the middle of the supposed pattern, there's an assignment to EDX, and then we can't simplify this because we don't know if EDX is going to be used in the future. Uh, right. Um, so there, that's an example of the idea uh, in which it fails, but it happens to be because of control flow. Uh, so right, what you're talking about is essentially the problem of instruction scheduling in compiler theory, which is how can we uh, you know, mix the instructions together and how can we do that in such a way that we exploit uh, you know, uh, parallelism in the, uh, in the pipeline. Uh, so that becomes a little more difficult. Uh, I don't have a very simple answer for you, except to say, you know, if you could say apply primitive decompilation techniques to take the expressions and sort of like merge them together, that at that point you could sort of work on, uh, you could sort of abstract beyond which individual statement is which and just talk about the symbolic expressions that are being computed. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, and if you didn't do that, then you'd sort of have a mess trying to figure out, you know, the dependencies between the instructions and whether or not, uh, you know, this is valid to do or not. So I think this is going to be our last question, so pressure. Why? It's the end of the night. If anyone has questions, I'll take them. Thank you very much. I was wondering, uh, I had a question about the uh, IR creation from the x86 instructions and the Intel manual. So I was wondering how deeply you went into the uh, Intel manual using your method of an IR uh, construction, because in my opinion, never having tried that, there are lots of edge cases and difficult instructions in the x86 instruction set, like parity flag generation, like B swap, like instructions with prefixes, and so on, that with my nearly non-existent understanding of what you said, will never be discovered automatically. So how much manual uh, curation did you still have to do? So the tool was created essentially to assist in manual analysis. Uh, it was me sitting there with the, the x86, uh, the Intel manuals, trying to figure out what it's actually talking about. And uh, I found that it was helpful for me to be able to, uh, you know, sort of like guess at what it was talking about and then have my tools systematically explore uh, uh, you know, all of my possible different guesses. Uh, so um, one, uh, one restriction of this is that uh, it really works best when we're only talking about registers. Uh, so, f you know, for example, if we had an add EAX D word pointer EBX, there's a memory access taking place there. Um, my tool, I would just use it to synthesize a translation for add EAX, EBX, so I'm sort of sidestepping the problem of uh, the fact that memory exists. Um, uh, with respect to the uh, prefix string instructions, like if you put a rep on the beginning uh, you know, of a move SB instruction, you know, you're right, that induces uh, a loop and a dependency upon another register uh, that may not be obvious. Um, but that being said, though, um, although there are these difficult cases like instructions that behave differently when memory is involved versus registers and uh, some of these edge cases involving uh, 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 repetition flags and so on, uh, my IR translator supports, you know, 175 instructions or something like that. So. Uh, the thing rarely ever throws an error telling me that it doesn't support a particular instruction. So, you know, it works well enough for uh, lots of, uh, most compiler generated stuff and uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, obfuscated stuff too. That's me half ass justifying, you know. It, yeah, it's not perfect, certainly. Please give a hand for both of our speakers. Thank you so much for coming out.
stay tuned for uh, an announcement and email for our uh, next event in the series. Thanks for coming out tonight. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>